from Mostly Books in Aberdeen, and I'm waiting for Githa Lodge, and she's just cropping up there. Hold on, it's very interesting. Come on in. I'm just about to appear. This is technology at its finest. This is amazing. Excellent. Hi. Hi. I'm, uh, You're looking very glamorous there, Gith. Thanks, thanks. This is my post shower. I'd better get changed into something a bit smarter than my disgusting. And, and a very nice poster behind you as well, looking very yeah. stuff. <laughs> really Sarah, Sarah has a bookshop behind her because Sarah is from Mostly Books, an independent bookshop in, in Abingdon. Uh, and she's kindly agreed to join us to talk about her, her um, shop and what she's doing in this era when there is a large sign outside your shop, presumably saying closed. Yes, yes. I don't like my shop being closed, but yes, it is at the moment. That must be a very sad thing to do. It is. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we're closed physically, but we are still going in terms of uh, orders. So we, we're taking phone orders, internet orders, email orders, you name it. Carry a pigeon, we'll take it. Um, but it is very strange not having people coming into the shop because that's a big part of what we do and what we what we love about the job. And, and Githa, you, are, you, you have got um, a new book out, Watching from the Dark, right? pretty much now. That must be the weirdest feeling, to have a new book out in hardback and very little idea of how people are getting hold of it at the moment. Yeah, it is quite strange. Um, I, I find it, I'm sort of just, I've sort of decided the best thing to do is not to worry too much whether people are managing to get it in, um, you know, in person and to focus on kind of alerting them to where they can get it uh, for example, for, by ordering from a fab independent, by, by ordering from someone like Waterstones, um, and to make sure they know they can get the ebook. Um, because I, I think, as everyone is finding, fewer and fewer people are making it out into um, into shops for very good reasons. Um, even when it comes to sort of Tesco's and Smiths, which officially are still largely open, um, people I think are going to have less time for going and finding the books. So um, it is strange. But it's uh, it's exciting to know that people are still offering it and offering to post it, which is uh, is a is a hugely positive thing. Yeah, I think from what I hear, and I've not been to a supermarket for some time myself, but I think because I'm supposed I'm supposedly I've got a book in a supermarket at the moment, but I don't think that I think they've taken away those bits of the shelves pretty much. There seem to be more important things to sell than our books, which I what? don't understand. But <laughs> um, outrageous. But. This might be quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think, you know, what's what's really interesting is things are changing shape as we speak. And, and this must be really interesting for booksellers trying to work out where the, you know, where the market is, because we're living in, we're, we are living in strange and uncertain times. How do you, yeah. how do you feel about that, Sarah? Well, we basically had to completely redefine our business model in the last week. So we have always been about face to face. We've taken orders. We do a lot of customer orders on a day to day basis, but that's usually telephone, email, um, and, and people come in and order from us face to face. Um, and what we've done in the last week is we've got all of our stock, all of this stuff behind me is now online on our website, which was something we managed to do really quickly, fortunately. Um, and we we kind of shifting to the point where we're people are ordering through that as well as the normal channels phone and and, and email but also we're using um a couple of our distributors a lot more so where whereas previously we would have had the books come into us and then we would have been responsible for distributing them now we're basically taking the order and then we're pushing it through the distributor directly which is um which is it seems to Fingers crossed, it seems to be working quite well, but it's just uh, it's just trying to work out how that process works and how that links in with when we take payment and what we then do at the point where when the shop reopens, there's more of us here and there's lots to think about. But at the moment, yeah. I'm just kind of trying to do what I can to just keep keep the business flowing. I've got down the bottom here, there's a little <laughs> crawler. With how I'm we can buy books, mostly books. Oh, I thank you. It right. um, Amazing. But, um, I mean, it's really weird, isn't it? Because you're, you're relatively new at Mostly Books. You've been, what, a couple of years ago you, you bought the bookshop, is that right? It's three years, three, three years, years in May. Yeah, I can't believe it's been three years. It feels like about 18 months. But, um, yeah, it's gone so quickly. Um, so, yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of a strange thing. To, oh, it's strange thing to happen at any time. But I just got to the point where I kind of felt like I pretty much had most of it covered. And now it's like massive curveball. And who, who, who knew what, what um, we had to deal with? Yeah, um, because um, it's not, yeah, like I was saying, it's not the shape you imagined a bookshop to be right now. I mean, a bookshop is something that faces out. I mean, it must be very, we're used to, you know, Githa and me are used to sitting at home for large, not talking to people for large chunks of the day. That's kind of probably <laughs> secretly part of the reason why we chose to do what we do. But you're completely opposite. I mean, it's a social business, book buying. So it must feel quite I'm hard. 
Yeah, I mean, I actually love that bit so much, so much so that I had to build myself an office out the back of the shop because what I was doing is I, when I was trying to do work, I would just get distracted by talking to customers. Right. So I have I have a shed at the back that I lock myself into um, when I actually have to get stuff done, which, Aww. yeah, I guess that's kind of what I'm having to do now is kind of just lock myself in the shop. But yeah, it's a very different beast. There's a, there's a really good social interaction on um, on social media with all of this though. There's a great network of independent booksellers across the country and we're all right. just kind of helping each other out, which is amazing. Lots of oh, advice yeah. and lots of moral support of messages. Oh. I run. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's really good. But people are so great. Aren't they? Aren't <laughs> they? <laughs> I love this industry. This is fascinating. So you're you're all talking to each other about what the shape of bookshops, you know, giving each other tips about how to do this at the moment. Yeah, and it's been invaluable. So there's a um the Booksellers Association set up something called the Booksellers Network. Um I want to say a year ago, it's probably longer than that now. Um, and it's just as simple as we have a few networking events a year and we have a Facebook group. And the Facebook group is just invaluable because we're all kind of far enough apart from each other so that we don't we're not in direct competition so we, we share ideas a lot and we do that when we go to um the big networking events as well it would have happened at the london book fair if that happened a few weeks ago and we have an annual conference with the booksellers association and various trade shows and we all just get together and bounce ideas around and i mean it's been like absolutely fundamental the information that other booksellers have given me to help me build their business um i'm going to come to you uh Geetha, in a bit but i've just sort of i just i'm, I'm fascinated about the, book, the whole bookshop thing but why did you so you you moved there to open to um buy the shop i think about three years ago what on earth made you buy an independent bookshop at a time when they weren't really doing very well i mean they've been doing a lot better in the last three years gradually but it's been you know it's a tough old business yeah it was an interesting decision um, i used to um i used to work in finance i used to work in investment banking um and uh i kind of I, I wasn't really enjoying it, so I, I quit my job. Various things happened. My um, my my dad got sick, and then he passed away. And it kind of makes you think about life and what you're doing and how you're spending your time. So I went and travelled for a year. And um, this is an absolutely true story, but it's it's very it's a very middle class story. I was um, I was I, I was in Chile, and I had a conversation with a woman, uh, sorry, a couple um, who's whose village had just had a, a lovely independent bookshop opening and uh, it was doing really well and I'd always loved books so I just kept thinking I'd like to do it and then hearing them say that the indie bookshop was working well in their small town I thought well if it can work for somebody else why can't it work for me so then I came back and thought I'll make it happen yeah and I'm sorry I will get I will get to you promise soon Githa but this is fascinating because actually I think something amazing has gone on I think bookshops have actually figured out how the future by high street is going to work. Do you know what I mean? I think they've turned themselves into these social places, um, which is kind of ironic now, but they have turned themselves into social. They've, they've changed the business, the model of how high streets work, and they're kind of showing a way ahead, I think. Do you, is that way too optimistic? Well, I hope it's not optimistic. Um, I... I certainly feel that way. I mean, we in the last couple of weeks, we've been making phone calls to numerous customers that we just know incredibly well now because we see them all the time um, as they come into our shop and, and we've got to know them as friends as well as customers. And so having that kind of social hub in the shop as well as providing the service of selling books and providing book recommendations, I think is, is a massive part of the community and and. I, I think I think it is the way forward. If, if other if other shops should be doing the same, I think that's that, that that's the way forward. The high street. I think. Um, now to you, uh, Githa. I mean, no, like, I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I presume this is a customer, Ingrid Pierce Cummings. Hi, Sarah. We miss you. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's I'm a sure you as well. Um, but I bumped into you at an event, which was pretty much around the time you were launching your debut. Uh, right. She lies in wait, yes. which was um some point last year. I think it was probably last spring, was it? I can't really it remember. Was, it was February, I think. Yeah, right. It was so it's slightly over a year ago. And what a fantastic moment that is when a debut's coming out. Um and and it went went very well for you, didn't it? It did. It went really well. And I was um I mean there was lots of neurosis on my part at every stage, regardless of how well or not it was going. Um, but I I really enjoyed that. Um, I really enjoyed the all of the time since it came out. And I felt incredibly well supported. I think having a publisher who is really, you know, behind it and knows that you need a bit of hand holding uh, is key there because they, they really did. Michael Joseph are uh, just fantastic. They are 
um, ultra supportive and they they loop me into everything including how the marketing work now I used to work in marketing so I <laughs> really wanted to know all the data and I was obsessed with the data and instead of just telling me to sort of you know sold off and right they told me uh, all, the, all the stuff that was going on and really kept me in the loop which made me feel like I was part of things and I think that was you know, incredibly good for uh, you know the panic levels rather than sort of just if I just sort of let them get on with it I think I would have been worrying so so that was really good to start with and um, and then getting the Richard and Judy um, book club was really really good uh, it made such a difference just to you know people just knowing about it and talking about it and um, it was really interesting to see actually yes even by December when the paperback came out I'm still at the point where most you know pretty much everyone hadn't heard of me and I'd say it's still the case that most people haven't heard of me but I saw it tipping on the internet between people saying oh you're reading that book I've never heard of it to people actually saying yeah. I've seen this one around and it was the best feeling in the world <laughs> just knowing that people had seen it and that it was out there so that was all it was all really good and I um yeah I had a had a a blast uh, doing all that and and it sort of, you know, continued on even into book two which is a it's a very different beast I think but um, yes. it's still fun yeah um let me sh uh, so tell tell me about um watching from the dark because that's I mean again it's a police procedural it's got the same character Jonah uh, Sheen's in it um but the beginning's very different it's, it starts with one of the creepier it's, it's it starts from a kind of even darker place it does. So it starts with uh, a man logging on to uh, video call his girlfriend and instead watching someone kill her, but never getting to see who it is. So it's um it's a bit more of a uh, yeah it's a, it's a bit of a darker start. This is not a cold case. This is very live. Uh, and Aidan, who is the the young man who is witnessing it, is in a very difficult situation because for all sorts of his own reasons he doesn't want to talk to the police so he then has to make some seriously big decisions about what he's going to do when this has happened um and um yeah so it's uh, rather than rather than going for another um sort of case based in some nostalgia and uh, a time past which is what i did with she lies in wait i want to do something that was a bit more contemporary and particularly where technology then played a part again because that's something that didn't happen very much in she lies in wait you're looking at a 30 year old mystery there and in this one i really wanted to look at how technology changes things from that very first moment onwards because um, she lies in wait is set in the early 80s that's right uh, it is early 80s isn't it that's right yeah 83 yeah right. So, uh, and you had that advantage of not having technology in, in that one to a certain extent. Well, certainly yeah. at the time of the murder. It um, is yeah. easier, yeah. <laughs> it and, is easier. And did you learn much? I mean, like, it's great, you know, I think the fir anybody's first book is like an immense thing. The first book just seems like a mountain to climb. And then somebody says, oh, you've got to have the, the other one finished and ready. And it's a whole different approach. But also you learn so Do you find you've, and I do you know you'd written stuff before, but. Had you looked, you know, did you find it a very different process writing the second? That was a long yeah. question. We've got another one from Andy Hill I want to ask afterwards. Oh, no, it's a great question. Uh, I, I, I found the process sort of, well, sort of similar but accelerated, I think, um, because with the first one, I'd rewritten and rewritten over quite a long time round a full-time job, um, yeah. which was more than a full-time job, and I really struggled to actually fit the writing in at that point. Um, whereas this one obviously happened quite a lot more quickly, which meant mainly that I had to accept that the first draft was going to be seen by people and I wasn't going to get to show a nicely polished version mm -hmm. of the very first. And that took some, you know, getting over myself because I really, really didn't want to be sending something that I knew. I, I, I finished this draft and was like, but it's terrible. There's a million things to change and I want to do them. Um, but I just had to basically say, this is dreadful just read it and and then we worked on it together so it was it was kind of compressed and I and that was a main change I think um, yeah. and as you said because I'd read uh, written quite a lot before um, in theatre and also other in sort of novels for kids which um, are currently on Wattpad the big online writing site it didn't feel such a big deal to write another book and in fact because also I'd had a book before this for adults which didn't sell to any publishers so I'd been through the process yeah. for that as well so yeah. um so that side was okay it was that that thing of having to actually do it you know within the year getting it submitted and I guess not getting to be really picky about it at the beginning are you are you getting much um, writing done now then how are you finding the the isolation Leaves, does it leave space for writing or is it the opposite? Well, I think it's much, I think my days are much harder because I did have my nine year old at school and I would go into coffee shops and write, which really suited me. Um, and particularly coffee shops, which are 
based in bookshops. That's my thing. So uh, that, that's uh, Waterstones not being open anymore is obviously very sad. <laughs> um, so I used to go out and I used to have complete clear space, the cycle ride there, all the rest of it and feel really kind of focused. So now I'm trying to do it around some homeschooling and the word mummy happening about 95,000 times a day. Your, your boy is what, 10 about? He's, no, he's nine. So yeah, nine. nearly 10, nearly 10. So he's, yeah. uh, you know, very lovely and, you know, independent in some ways. But given that there are only two of us in the building, I don't actually understand why the word mummy has to happen quite as often. <laughs> that quite a lot. That. That's it. That's a really creepy start to a book there already. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I have absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm totally in awe of everyone that's that's doing the homeschooling thing with their kids at the moment. I think it's it just power power to the parents as well. So, oh, and I mean, I think also, oh my gosh, teachers, we love you even more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions for um, from people for you, Githa. One was uh, Andy Hill, who's a writer himself, actually. How was the debut process? How many publishers did you pitch to, and did you get an agent first? Oh, fab! Yes, so I did get an agent first, and I got an agent in the middle of doing the creative writing MA at UEA, when I uh, was actually largely doing script, but with some prose. And the main thing that happened to me during the first year was that I got taught how to pitch an idea for the first time. Uh -huh. um, so I then went uh, went to an event in London, ready to meet lots of agents and realized that it was just an absolute bun fight. And that none of them were going to want to talk to me because they were looking harassed. So I walked out, took these printouts that I had to the nearest three agencies and dropped them off thinking that I would have six to eight weeks to get a, the rest of the book written and then had a reply the next day and then another one the day after that from two of them and then had to write the book in the next five days. It was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying because I basically implied that I finished it. It was, don't do that, by the way. <laughs> wow, we do that. That sounds a perfect way to do it because it you can't the pressure. It's it's great. Right. I'm it's sweating. Terrible. Um, but having done that, then I had this sudden revelation that actually this is a really stupid way to pick an agent. So I just thought, why, why don't I actually think about the agents I wanted, not the ones that were geographically closest to the place? <laughs> that I was um, and I'd always, always had in mind um, uh, Viv Shuster and Felicity Blunt from Curtis Brown because I'd met Viv in the Ladies' Lose in Ely Cathedral once, and um, and she just was just hilarious. And we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about writing at all. We were talking about um, the uh, the music that was going on because it was Margaret Atwood's book launch, The Year of the Flood. Um, but she was just brill. And I just thought, you know, oh, gosh, I must remember her. So I went back to them and went in to see them and ended up working with those two instead. So um, and now Felicity is my main agent. And honestly, you know, I just I adore her. Absolutely adore her. I'm hoping your advice to people isn't to hang around toilets. to get Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird one. I think my only advice there is, if you do meet an agent in the toilet, don't mention your book. Just don't. Ah, no. <laughs> I think if I had, you know, it would have been awkward. As it was, it was fine. Sarah's asking, why did you uh, place Three Lies in Wait in 1983? Oh, good question. I love the 80s. I have that. Uh, I mean, I was born in actually a year after in 84. And I have such sort of strong childhood memories, uh, as a lot of people do, of those first few years. And all the stuff that was very exciting to me but I wasn't allowed to be involved with you know all the drinking and, and all the rest of it um, and I just really wanted to set something then and I also thought there's a real power to that feeling of you know nostalgic feeling of going back to another time um, it's why I picked the new forest as well um, and I um, really I, I really liked the idea of paring it down so the tech wasn't there as we talked about earlier so that this was a much kind of purer investigation where you know they didn't even have DNA because of the time that had passed, mm -hmm. and and uh, so that was the, the those a lot of those reasons were behind the decision. So oh, and it was a very hot summer. It was a very hot summer, nineteen eighty three, which uh, which which made a difference, um, as well as being the year before nineteen eighty four when uh, when in George Orwell terms everything. You went couldn't through. have named it that anyway. No, no. <laughs> I did try to name it 1983. When I, I did. Was. I did set my first series was set around the 60s, and it was a real discovery finding out what people couldn't do in the 1960s. It was fascinating. I set did an entire first draft, in which a 22 year old WPC was the driver, and then I found a woman who served in 1968 in the right division, and I said to her, "Here you go. Look, I've got this great idea." And I explained what happened. She said it couldn't happen because women weren't allowed to drive police cars in 1968. Mm -hmm. Oh, kidding. my Lord. Insane. And you kind of forget the world was like that, don't you? Do you know what I mean? So I had to sort of tear up the drafts and start again. But it was good for it because, um, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's good to have to, you know, 
work out where, you know, the bit between reality and the made up bit your book fits, if you know what I mean, when you're writing in a historical time. But anyway, I want to talk a bit more about, um, about mostly books, because last time I went there, it didn't look like this. Hold on. It's changed. Oh, look. I love it. I'm so proud. You're just inside there, in the dark. In Sorry? This, in, are you just behind this window that I'm showing? You actually, if well, I could yeah. have a live stream, would I be able to see you in that I'm window? kind of sat diagonally. I'm kind of behind the door. So oh, almost okay. directly behind the posts between the door right. and the window. Oh. That's where I am. Yeah. But you've changed. Yeah. You've changed. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I um, I saw when I took over the shop, I obviously inherited everything, the branding and everything and the name. And I loved I loved it. Um, but I, I kind of felt like I wanted to freshen it a bit. Um, and I did that with the interior really early on. So I basically refurbed the entire shop. We did it in um, four days in the June after I took over the shop, which was no, no. Yeah, it was four days, four days. Um, we closed on the Saturday night and we reopened on the Thursday morning. Um, and it was that really hot June, you know, June 2017. Yeah. And um, we were literally, we were painting table legs and they were drying before we finished painting them. It was like, it was crazy. So I did all the inside and I was really pleased with that. But um, I kind of felt like the fronts needed a bit of, a bit of updating. So I, and it, took, it took me so long to work out the logo and the colour. It took about 18 months, but we got there did in you, September. Did you logo yours? Is that your own? No, I got somebody to help me do it, but I was quite... I was quite specific about what I wanted, shall we nice. say. <laughs> task master there. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, thank it's you. I'm really, really great. Mm. I mean, it's a lovely, lovely town. And you've just about got enough space to squeeze events in there, which is fantastic. Yeah, well, um, another thing. Oh, no, I think, yeah, we had done it when you when you came. We moved our counter. So when I first had the shop, our counter took quite a lot of space. We, now we can fit about 43 people in. Oh, it's, really? It's yeah, yeah. Right, but we give it four, three yeah. people in the shop. Yeah. But intimate. Yeah. Yeah. Who's these? No, it's, it's a great space, and it's a you know, it's it, it's where a bookshop should be if you're looking for one. If you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I love um, it. I, I was wondering, are you finding that you're selling very different titles at the moment? I, I've seen some great lists of 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 books to distract us. You know, the sort of you know, are people reading a lot of P.G. Woodhouse or something like that at the moment? I have had a bit of that. I've had a, a few people. Um, you know, requesting books about, you know, the end of the world, which is a little <laughs> bit depressing. But no, generally, um, we're following similar trends to what we were seeing in the shop. Um, the one thing, obviously, that we aren't seeing so much if we're doing postal orders is a lot of the big chunky hardbacks are, are kind of tailoring down a bit. A lot of people are going towards paperbacks. Some people are looking for quite a lot of escapism, I think. So um, it, we're definitely, definitely fiction heavy in terms of what, we, what we're getting with at the moment, the non-fiction and... and Cook, some cookery, but mostly fiction. And in terms of yourselves, are you both, you know, how are you maintaining your sanity? I mean, it sounds like actually that, Sarah, you, you know, actually the amount of work you've got to do hasn't necessarily decreased. And therefore, that's that's not a bad thing at the moment. But are you no. finding it, are you finding other things to do to keep yourself occupied? Well, I've got to, I'm, tr I'm trying to get the routine. Um, until Monday, I had a couple of other people here in the shop with me. Um, but obviously, when with the lockdown discussion, the decision that had to change, I'm living above the shop at the moment because I'm renovating my house as well because there's not enough going on. So I thought I'd, <laughs> I'd throw that into the mix. Um, so, but it's actually quite convenient because it means I can literally just come downstairs and I'm I'm here. So yeah. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to work out what the new normal is. You know, I've said to everyone, I'm I'm here from. For phone calls between nine, I said three, but now I'm saying nine to one, um, and then emails and and web orders can come in whenever, obviously. But I'm just trying to get that process in place about when I'm getting up and when I'm doing everything, and and then when I'm actually going out for my exercise and sanity. It's quite important. Right. Very important. That bit. That bit is is. I, I I just did mine this lunchtime, and I feel so much better having done it. <laughs> I managed out? to yesterday, but I haven't done it yet. So I, after this, I'm going out for a nice long walk and I can't wait. Yeah. Mm. I'm making Rufus run with me. So. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. How's it taking that? that? You've got to watch the point where she gets significantly faster than you, which probably won't, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. it sort of happens at the beginning and then he, what he fails to do is pace it, so then I win. <laughs> uh, oh. Grind them down. Keep them, keep them in their place. How are you finding um, that, William? Ingrid asked, um, hold on. Is Mostly Books doing any children's book reading during the lockdown? Um, I don't know if that's even something you've got capacity to do. 
Well, funny enough, we have been looking at it um, until the lock, until this week. We were actually going to um, film a load in the Amy Theatre um, and then start distributing them um, through our social media channels. We're looking at different ways of doing that, even if it's just um, members of the team uh, kind of filming them and sending them sending them through social media. So we are just keep an eye on our Facebook and our Twitter, um, and we will be getting some stuff out there. Um, we are looking. We're also working with a couple of authors to see what we can do about. Um, doing some live events with them as well but it's at the moment it's although we normally do a huge number of events obviously we're not doing quite as many at the moment in terms of trying right. to get the books into people's hands instead I, I'm yeah, I just going to offer my services if it's useful I'm going to be doing um from Friday onwards I'm going to be reading uh, a chapter a day of one of my big children's series online oh, and that'd be so amazing. happy to happy to dip in if that's useful as well and, and club together and do something yeah that would be brilliant people, we can share that where will people find that so it's going to be on youtube but i'll be showing it on my social channels so okay. i will right. i'll shout about it i um i, I, I think it's really it. interesting the way that that um there's new and whether we all get tired of this in a week but there are all sorts of new connections being made you know i'm actually talking to my even my siblings far more than i normally talk mm. to them do you know what i mean there's all things going on in that Sort of shape uh, but given what are you actually working on now so is this book three you're working on now or is that already put book to bed three is basically done um i've got yeah. copy edits to do which should come back shortly so i just finished my third draft uh sort of a week ago um yeah. and that means i'm cracking on with book four um and so trying to do a little bit of the kids stuff in the middle as well because it's been a while um, but I, I say that as if it's going to be easy to write around the lockdown, and it's not. <laughs> it's going to be challenging. Um, but at least then, if I write something interesting, I can at least maybe read it to my nine-year-old, and he might actually be interested. So, you know, it should be good. How about you? I, I'm, I'm writing two books at the moment. I'm writing one in my series. I write a series set in Kent starring uh, uh, Alex Cooperty, and, um, yeah. which is a contemporary uh, police procedural. And I chose Dungeness because I love it as a place, and, and uh, it's been... A lovely series to be writing but i'm actually also writing i'm trying experimenting with writing two books at the same time um and i do one in, the, one in the morning that... and one in the afternoon no it's kind of works it sounds kind of mad and self-flagellating but actually i find if i'm writing one book i'm, I'm a bit tired by the afternoon and the and the creativity seems to drop off but i still right. sort of slug away at it um whereas if i start another thing if i swap around lunchtime and start writing another book i seem to be re-energized and then i do the same one i was writing in the afternoon the next morning and swap over and I'm writing more words. They might be worse words. I don't know. Yet. But I'm <laughs> doing one's a kind of contemporary thriller um, set at sea, and the other's um, firmly on land. On the actually, it's not. It involves some fishing boats on the Kent coast. Um, oh. But you know, um, I'm finding the whole lockdown thing great for writing. I have to say, it's it's. How you know, dare you? <laughs> no. I know. Just send your kid that. over. It's fine. Just... <laughs> Here you go. Um. Listen, we're almost at, at half an hour, so I think we ought to um, uh, wrap it up there um, and let people get on with their lives. After half an hour, I think um, they might have had enough of us, but we've had lots of people watching. I can see from those little statistics that occasionally appear on, on the top of the page. Um, and thanks very much to them. Over the next few days, I'm speaking to a list of people whose names I've mostly forgotten now. I'll be speaking to a um, very good writer called Rebecca Waite sometime next week. I'm speaking to um, Anne Cleves at some point. Uh, I think the... 31st um i'll be more organized i'll add some comments and say all the people i am actually speaking to in the next few days um very soon I'm, oh I'm, I'm speaking to um to um oh god it's gone anyway i i'll i'll, I'll put it on the comments that's so organized to me but i think people like a kind of amateurishness in these don't they absolutely it's charming yeah. It's good. Anyway, thanks you two so much. Um, you've you've brightened my afternoon no end, and um, uh, good luck with the shop. I hope it goes well over the next few weeks. And um, lovely to speak to you, Gifford. See see you in the flesh again at some point. Great, thank you. Thanks, Brilliant. Great. Bye. All the best. Bye. Bye.